Thank you. So um, I wasn't quite sure what sort of an audience I'd have, so I'm going to begin at the beginning and we'll work up from there. Um, uh, so what I thought I'd do is um, start with a bit of history about stimulation of the brain and um, in particular non-invasive stimulation. So it's easy if you are a neurosurgeon to stimulate the brain because you can just take away the, the skull and the scalp and, and stimulate the brain directly like neurosurgeons do. Uh, in fact, it was only in a, the 1860s and 70s that it was discovered that the brain itself was electrically excitable, that you could stimulate parts of it and produce effects, particularly movement of the opposite side of the body, which is what people first observed. Uh, and so it was only in the early 1860s and 70s that the first experiments were done in cats and dogs and monkeys uh, where people directly stimulated the brain uh, and showed that they could produce movements. And from that, then they decided that they also could show that movements were localised to particular parts of the brain. Before that, it wasn't known how well function was localised in the brain. So uh, just, just being able to stimulate the brain early on provided some solutions to questions that were, had been unresolved till that time. Uh, the first time someone stimulated the brain of a human being was only a couple of years, actually, after the first experiments had been done on animals. So they did the animal experiments. And then a guy in uh, the USA, in Ohio, um, had the opportunity, as I'll show you, to stimulate a human brain. Uh, so this is, this is a guy, Robert Bartolo, who was professor of medicine uh, at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Ohio. And he wrote a paper that he entitled Experimental Investigations into the Functions of the Human Brain. And this was, I say, about two years after the first descriptions had been written up of the electrical excitability of animal brains. Uh, and he was saying with this that, yeah, uh, you, even though I'm out here in Ohio and all the work's being done in Europe, you know, in those days by the Germans and the so on, uh, who were doing the electrical stimulation of animals, he was on top of things and um, he'd been reading the literature and he also was an expert in electrical stimulation. They were using electrical stimulation in those days to stimulate peripheral nerves uh, because that was well known. And there were a number, a couple of different sorts of machines that they had for stimulating nerves. There was a, a galvanic machine here with the galvanic cells, a sort of DC current uh, stimulator. And then there was the phradic stimulator here with a coil here uh, and again a cell and, and uh, um, uh, a contact point here. And this gives you a sort of alternating current stimulation. And they were stimulating nerves with, with both of these types of stimulators. And they had, in fact, in Ohio, uh, both sets of these things. It was a pretty advanced place, in fact, this hospital that uh, Robert Bartolo worked in. So he had the kit there to stimulate, uh, and he had a patient who presented in a most unusual way. So I'll read, this, read bits of this, because you pro probably can't see right at the back. It says, Mary... It's a woman, medium height, rather feeble-minded, one of five children. Uh, sh her health has always been good until 13 months ago when a small ulcer appeared on the scalp and she said she thought it had been produced by the friction of a piece of whalebone in her wig. She was wearing a wig and it had a whalebone in. You may say, why is this young woman wearing a wig? Uh, well, she, as an infant, she'd fallen into the fire and her scalp was badly burned and the hair never reproduced, and so she was wearing a wig. Okay, in fact, she probably was wrong. She probably had a tumour uh, growing on her scalp, but uh, that's not said here. Uh, she's uh, moder moderately healthy, and what she has on presentation, she has an open ulcer on, on the, and then pretty much in the middle of the head here, on the scalp, a big horrible ulcer, <laughs> in fact, in the middle of her head. Uh, uh, and the description says it's, it's about, about this big, really. Pretty nasty thing that's eroded the scalp beneath it. So it's the skin's covering the, the brain, and he says, and, and the pulsations of the brain, the, the skull's eroded, 
So the, 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 the bone has gone, the, the, the cancer's eaten the bone uh, under the skin, the skin's still there, and has, uh, the skull has disappeared over a space two inches in diameter where the pulsations of the brain are plainly seen beneath it. So basically, he's got a patient where the brain is uh, just underneath the skin. And he took the opportunity, rightly or wrongly, to stick some needles through the skin uh, into the brain and stimulate it. Just, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a crazy thing to do, actually. But anyway, so he took one of those big machines. Uh, it took a phradic stimulator, in fact. And he uh, passed an insulated needle into the left posterior lobe so that the non-insulated portion rested entirely in the substance of the brain. And the other insulated needle was placed on, in contact with the dura mater, that's the uh, external coating of the brain, within a fourth of an inch of the first. So it's a quarter of an inch apart. And uh, he describes what happens when the phoradic stimulation was turned on. And he says that there was uh, muscular contraction of the right, the right side. He was stimulating the left. Uh, and uh, of both the upper and lower extremities, so that's both arm and leg, with visible contraction of the left, orbicularis oculi, palpebrum, that's, oh, that's around here in the face, uh, and dilation of the pupils. Uh, so that's actually pretty big, that tells me as a physiologist, that's a pretty big stimulus because it's spreading to affect both the arm area and the leg area of the brain, the legs up here, the arms here, and the eyes and the face are slightly anterior to that. So it's quite, a, he's stimulating through one needle and the stimulus is spreading quite a long way from it to, to uh, um, recruit all this activity. Uh, and Mary complained a very strong and unpleasant feeling of tingling. So she's feeling sensation from the sensory cortex stimulation, as well as the movements it's producing. Uh, and, um, and she says, notwithstanding the very evident pain from which she suffered, she smiled as if much amused. <laughs> so that's the first observations in humans that A, the brain's electrically excitable and that it's got functional localization, that a certain part of the brain gives you certain sensations. Um, you tend to think these days that you, uh, people doing these things and nobody really caring about ethics and whatnot in the past, they did care. Actually, they, they, his colleagues. Uh, actually reacted quite strongly to him publishing this paper. And just to fill you in, just it's a little social history. Uh, his colleagues actually didn't think much of him doing this. In fact, the patient died three or four days later. Whether it's anything to do with the stimulation, we don't know. She must have been in quite a bad way with a, a cancerous ulcer that big in the middle of her scalp. Uh, and his, his, his colleagues in the Cincinnati Medical Association passed this resolution against him, which says, whereas Dr. Bartolo, in his zeal for scientific research, has recently made a series of experiments with electricity upon the brain of a patient by inserting needles into the substance thereof and passing currents from these to different parts of the body, causing pain, convulsions, and probably hastening death, we are ever ready and willing to accord the greatest praise and honour to original investigators in any part of medicine, yet these experiments are so in conflict with the spirit of the profession and opposed to our feelings of humanity that we cannot allow them to pass unnoticed. And we resolve that no member of the medical profession is justified in experimenting upon his patient except for the purpose and with the hope of saving said patient's life or of child in utero. Interesting. So they didn't like it being done. And uh, people did care in those days about what was being done to their human uh, studies. And uh, I think we're a lot more careful these days, too. Anyway, so to complete the story, stimulation of the brain uh, then was pursued uh, regularly by neurosurgeons when they were operating on the brain. When neur neurosurgeons operate on the brain, they often operate with the patient um, conscious so that they can stimulate parts of the brain and identify which parts of the brain are which. Because, you know, when you, when you take the, the skull off, uh, it, it's not labelled which bits are which, you know. Um, and although you think you know where the central sulcus is and where the 
sensory and motor areas that are supposed to be. You know, you, you see the pictures of them in textbooks. It's not actually always like that. And the bits of the brain are always actually in the same place in everybody. So when you're a neurosurgeon, you actually go in and you make sure that, you know, the motor area of the cortex is here. Because when you stimulate it, this moves. Uh, and so on. So that, that's why they routinely were using it, even from the 1900s onwards, um, in patients. There were a lot of studies after that trying to stimulate the brain through the skull. And uh, this is the first one that I've seen. Um, uh, and it says electrical stimulation of the unexposed cerebral cortex by these chaps here. And the illustration is here. Um, there's uh, a machine here. There's a chap lying down here, for some reason in his pyjamas by the looks of it. And he's got some sort of bandage around his head where he's got two electrodes, plate electrodes, uh, 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 on the skull underneath these bandages. And they're passing a fairly large current between these electrodes. And you're supposed to be seeing that when the current's turned on, when the lights light up here, the arm moved gradually up like that. Okay? They were stimulating at 30 hertz uh, for 40 seconds. That's quite a lot of stimulation. And that, I can tell you, would have been quite painful, <laughs> in fact. Um, but they, they produced some movement. <coughs> uh, you may ask again, well, this is very poor evidence, isn't it? Couldn't they do better than that? as a way of, uh, of showing you what's going on here. Um, and the reason, uh, one of the reasons is, in fact, that this paper was actually about stimulation of baboons. And it's only in passing that they made this observation on one of themselves. Uh, and it just says that in passing. And they put this uh, illustration in and say, oh, by the way, we did it on ourselves, and it worked on us too. But it's really about baboons. Um, and uh, I don't know why these days, why, you know, we all should put the species in the title, I think, <laughs> of our papers when we write them. Okay, uh, so after that, uh, it was about 1980 when this chap, Merton, uh, found out that it was also possible to stimulate the brain, perhaps more reasonably, in humans with an electrical method, just with a big electric stimulus, very brief one. Uh, and his secret of success, really, was to f discover that, in fact, everybody in the past, when they were stimulating the brain, and even Bartolo, was using repetitive stimulation, you know, 30 hertz, 60 hertz stimulation, 50 hertz, and they're all doing stimulation for several seconds, and it works great, and it's fine. But when you do that, and you try and get electricity through the skull with that sort of frequency of stimulation, it's quite painful, and people don't like it. You get a lot of scalp muscles contract and local sensation as well. And that's why people don't like doing it. In fact, Merton found out that you just need a single pulse of electricity, and if you put a single pulse of electricity and apply it, in this case, that's to the, where the hand area of the motor cortex is um, located. That's, it's about here, just above the ear. Uh, and if you stimulate there with a single pulse, you can see on the opposite side of the body, the hand will just twitch. It'll just do something like this, a tiny little twitch. But that's enough. You can measure it, it's fine. Uh, and so this was the, the first demonstration that in humans you can stimulate the brain quite non-invasively. And it, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but we, we used to use that fairly regularly as a way of stimulating the, the brain of ourselves. And that was in 1980. Then, oops, what did I do? Oh, I turned it off. Ah, that's better. Okay. <laughs> uh, actually, just, and again, this is just a little bit of history for you. Um, Merton, Merton was my teacher, by the way, in Cambridge when I was a student. Um, and he was, a, he was a fairly remarkable chap. And he, in fact, gave a lecture on this. And he... He demonstrated, you know, his, his uh, electrical brain stimulation in front of everyone. And he ended the lecture by saying, and this, he gave this lecture in 1981. And he says, I'll now end by demonstrating how failure of confidence and perseverance can hold things up. I have here a device. He never threw anything out. He kept everything. 
So he had in the back of his lab a device I built in 1947 to stimulate the brain through the scalp. Uh, and he was trying to do it with repetitive stimulation as well in 1947. He said it consists of an old-fashioned gramophone motor driving contacts which can connect a condenser alternately to a battery then to the subject. So it could give long trains of stimuli and he tried to apply it through large plate electrodes like other people had done uh, on either side of the head. And he says this was unsuccessful because it was too painful. Uh, before the voltage could be turned up enough to make it effective. And he now shows, and he demonstrated it there and then, that using this original stimulator, but with the right sort of electrodes in the right place, and limiting the number of stimuli to a few at high voltage, we could have succeeded all those years ago in stimulating the motor cortex. Isn't that interesting? That's a little message for all of us, really, isn't it? You know, you can do your experiment, and it doesn't work. You just have to do it in the right way. And... And, and it works, and that's, that's the most re remarkable thing. Anyway, it took him 30 years to figure that out. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then we got to magnetic stimulation of the brain, which is, I'm sure, what you know more about than I do. Uh, and this is Tony Barker, who was part of the team who produced the first magnetic stimulator that was used on the brain. I think the first magnetic stimulator they used just to stimulate nerves in, in, in the arm. Uh, and then... Um, the story was that uh, they were developing this stimulator and, and just showing that it was possible to stimulate electrically nerves in the arms and the legs, and, and that was all they knew about. Uh, and Merton, who was stimulating electrically the brain, heard about their work. He went up, uh, he wrote to them and said, um, will you bring your stimulator down to London so that we can see if it will stimulate the brain? So they brought it down to London, uh, and Merton said, turn it up full and put it on my head. <laughs> so they did. <laughs> I know that because I was there. And <laughs> so they did, and it worked. And it made his hand twitch, you know. Said, ah, it works. And it was amazing. And then everybody else lined up to have their brain stimulated. <laughs> it was great. It was wonderful. Uh, but these guys, the guys in Sheffield uh, didn't know di and haven't had actually thought of doing the brain uh, because, of course, even though we can stimulate nerves in the periphery, there's no point because we can stimulate nerves in the periphery pretty well uh, for all clinical purposes using electric, conventional electric stimulation, uh, which is cheaper and easier and so on. Um, but stimulating the brain has got the extraordinary advantage that it really is painless, it doesn't cause scalp muscle contractions, and you can do it and people don't really care. Uh, and as you'll know, uh, when you do brain stimulation, you uh, produce a very high magnetic field by discharging, in most cases, a capacitor through a coil of wire. That produces a magnetic field at right angles. It's a rapidly changing magnetic field. It goes up to a, a very large value and then back down to a zero, all in about a millisecond or so, and the rate of change of the magnetic field uh, causes uh, an induced electric current, an electric field, in conductive things nearby, such as the brain. Um, when I explain this to, um, to people who don't know anything about engineering, I usually say that you can imagine the, the magnetic field carries, the, I hope this is right, it carries the electric stimulation from outside the brain to the inside. And that's all you need to know, really. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, but as soon as you say that, they say, oh, it's physics. <laughs> Faraday, physics. Oh, don't understand that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's great. So it's a great way of, of stimulating. The, the, one of the problems is with a coil like this, uh, a round coil, the, the, uh, the stimulus falls off fairly rapidly with distance from, from the, uh, the, the surface of the coil. So if you go five centimetres distance, you only get less than half the stimulating power, um, which is OK. It, it means that with fairly conventional coils, we're quite happy stimulating the outside parts of the brain, which is most of the cerebral cortex. And that's got interesti enough interesting things in to keep me happy for a long time. Uh, how you can stimulate deeper without affecting everything else, is, is more of a, of a mystery, I think. Um, so you, you certainly hold up the theory of stimulation of the brain. 
you can certainly, but you, 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 you,
and it may be several centimetres away from where it normally is because of the way the tumour's grown. And so people uh, find this method very useful in pre-operative planning of the brain, of the surgery. They can stimulate and it's very accurate. It's accurate within a few millimetres of where the position of the motor cortex is. And they say, we think the motor cortex is here. And that will help the surgeon guide where he makes his hole uh, on the scalp. And he can go directly to that point and confirm electrically stimulating the brain during the surgery that is in the right place. Uh, so it speeds the whole thing up. You know, you get this additional information before you do the surgery of exactly where you ought to be thinking of, uh, of focusing your attention. Other things you do with TMS these days to look at how it interacts with the brain, you can do TMS and uh, look at how it interacts with the EEG signal. TMS does, of course, produce a very big artefact in the EEG, but with good amplifiers that can be reduced uh, very, very much. And you can get very good ideas of what uh, TMS does to the brain activity if you record simultaneously the EEG when you do the stimulus. Uh, people have done TMS uh, within fMRI machines. Again, that's, that's a challenging thing to do. Um, this, is, this is a student of mine who was a, one of the first people to develop the, the, the technique, uh, Sven Bessman. Um, what happens is you've got a very large static field in the MRI coil, say about two Teslas, and when you put the uh, stimulating coil in, you, could get, you get another two Teslas and they may not line up, you know, that, that what happens is you, you get uh, twisting forces on, on the coil, usually, depending on its orientation to the, to the field. Um, this sort of orientation, you know, it's not so bad. Um, yes, 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 that did happen uh, on testing, but nowadays they have, they have... Hmm. Well, yeah, what they, what they do when they do the stimulation, they, you can do it in various ways, of course, because the blood flow, if you're doing a functional MRI, the blood flow changes a long time after the actual time of stimulation. So you, can stimula you could stimulate several times uh, in, in, the, in a second here, and then look at the changes in blood flow afterwards. So that's one way that they use this. Uh, another way is to um, put the stimuli in between the the scan, um, the, the the scan scans of the, the the slices of the brain. So when the fMRI machine does slices of the brain, it, it does a slice at a time across like that, and it has a pause at the end of each slice of a s 100 milliseconds or something like that. And so you can put in the TMS stimulus after the end of a slice, just at the end of a slice, give the stimulus, it causes a bit of vibration um, of the coil uh, and, and, and the head coil actually, um, which has gone by the time you begin the next slice. So that's another way that they do the TMS in the fMRI. Uh, anyway, you can, get, you can get reasonable signals. <laughs> and you can of course do TMS uh, with NEARS uh, because that, you don't get any interference there. The, the main problem is that many of the NEARS devices have got these quite large optodes on the scalp. They don't, they don't need to be that big these days, I'm sure, um, which means you can't get the coil very close to the head. But that's me being stimulated and having my NEARS recorded at the same time. And again, you can see blood flow changes in the, in the, in, in the brain after you've done the stimulation. Okay, so... Lots of ways of interacting with TMS and seeing what it does to the brain. Um, TMS EEG, well, yeah, okay, you can see waves that are evoked in the brain. This is an interesting one. Um, this is just, this is a very simple thing. You, you stimulate one bit of the brain and actually the activity will spread from the site of stimulation over to other bits of the brain. All the bits of the brain being connected, you know, you just it obviously like that. And you can use the EEG and you record the EEG waves and you can show that activity spreads from the point of stimulation here to the front and the back of the brain uh, over 
period of time of a fifth of a second of so, or so. Uh, that's in a normal, active, awake person. Uh, if you put them to sleep with an anaesthetic, uh, basically the activity d doesn't spread through the brain. It's, it's a neat way of showing you know, the brain activity has been damped down a little bit. Um, uh, you can interact in lots and lots of ways. And TMS EEG signals, oh, yeah, I don't need to show you them, but you can, you can record fMRIs of TMS and fMRI and so on. So it's great. It's great. There's another method on the market these days. There's a few more ways of stimulating the brain on the market these days that you perhaps ought to know about. Uh, one that's very popular is this one that's called transcranial direct current stimulation. Now, this looks bizarre, but um, let's go with it. Uh, and it, it's a transcranial electric way, right? So we've got two large pad electrodes. That one's supposed to be on the motor cortex, hand area, and this one's on the front of the head here. Uh, and you connect this one to the anode and this to the cathode or vice versa. And what you do is you pass one or two milliamps through these electrodes for several minutes. Now, if you do that, most of the currents can conduct it across the skin. Uh, but a little bit of it goes into the brain. People modelled, you know, what sort of currents are likely to go into the brain if you do this and where are the currents likely to flow and so on. And what you find in these models and what probably happens <coughs> is that the, uh, the stimulus, it doesn't produce action potentials or anything like that in neurons. When you do TMS, you produce action potentials in, in the neurons. You actually activate them. With this sort of stimulation, what you do is we, call, we say it polarizes the neurons. It just changes their potential, their membrane potential, by about half a millivolt or less than that. Just have a small biasing effect on the excitability of neurons in the brain. As I say, it's a very small effect. A half a millivolt when you might need 10 or 15 millivolts to do anything interesting. Um, so it's a very small effect, but perhaps, perhaps because it affects a lot of neurons in the same way at the same time, it may be the reason why you can sometimes see behavioral effects of this sort of stimulation. And I'll explain those in a minute. But th this is a technique. Um, there is, there is a, ver there's a version of this that, that, that's actually, a people often, w when I tell them this sort of stimulation, people look at me and think, ah, that can't do very much, can it? Actually, it can't do very much, but it might do a little bit. Um, and, but there's a way of demonstrating that this form of stimulation can interact with nerves uh, in the brain in a way and that is, if you take the same stimulator, the same electrodes, or electrodes, if you put two electrodes each side of your ear here, on the bone behind the ear, and you connect them to a 9-volt battery, uh, what happens is this. If you're standing up with your feet closed and your eyes together, and you connect a 9-volt battery like this, you will sway towards the anode of the battery. The reason being that the electricity Again, it just polarizes. It has a small effect on the balance organs. Now, the balance organs are here in the ear, just underneath the skull on each side. And the balance organs, you've got two a set on each side. Normally, they're balanced. You're standing up, OK? And if they're balanced, you think you're standing upright. Now, if you polarize the neurons on one side more than the other, they become a little bit imbalanced, just a tiny bit imbalanced. And your brain interprets that as you being over to one side. So what you do is you push yourself to the other side. And you, pu you push, you sway to the other side. You see what I mean? And you can, that you can demonstrate this to yourself. It's just a way of trying to convince yourself that these small changes in polarity of populations of neurons can produce effects. Uh, we think something like that can happen in the brain here. But perhaps not as complicated. Yeah. No, it's just, it's just applying an electric field to the neurons, you know. I mean, it's just changing the voltage across the membrane, basically. Is that okay? <laughs>
you know, I mean, it's just changing the, the, the electric field outside the, the individual neurons, I suppose. Is that happy? Are you happy with that? Yeah. So it's just an electric phenomenon. Um, and like I say, it just changes your excitability a wee bit. Um, and, and it has effects on the brain, um, behaviourally. Um, you can show, actually, they've done a lot of experiments with this direct current stimulation in animal brain, brain, and what it shows is if you listen to the firing rate of neurons in the brain, you find that neurons near the anode increase their firing rates just a little bit. So the, the neurons in the brain are sitting there, they're firing, doing their stuff. And if you put an anode nearby, uh, they'll just get a little bit more excited, just fire a few more times. And if the cathode is nearby, the stimulation rate will decrease. Uh, in these animal experiments, <coughs> the currents that are used are about 10 times more than we expect to uh, happen in humans. So uh, although you can see very clear things in animals, you wouldn't expect to see very much in humans, actually. So I'm just trying to say the effects are very small. Okay, I'll, I'll not go through those. Okay, uh, another, thi another thing. It, two more ways of stimulating the brain that have been reported. Uh, this one's a peculiar one. Um, Static magnets. Uh, people have found out that if you uh, put a, a very powerful static magnet on your head for 10 minutes <laughs> and take it off, then the excitability of the brain underneath where you've had the magnet declines slightly by 20% uh, for the next 10 minutes minutes or so. So this is the effect of a static magnet on the brain has this after effect on the excitability. Um, I have no idea how this works. <laughs> no idea. But people have done this, they've done this in a number of labs. Now, the magnets are big. Uh, I can't work out how big they are in terms of what the Teslas would be at the brain. But they say this large magnet I mean, there are these powerful, ultra-powerful small magnets that are about this big. They say the large magnet that produces this effect can itself support a weight of 76 kilograms. So I don't know how you work out how strong a magnet that is, but perhaps some of you here can do that. I can't. Uh, but I believe it's quite a, a powerful magnetic field. I'm sure there is. What is it? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, they say that this magnetic field, this static magnetic field can have, have an after effect on the brain. Um, and that, you know, again, I'm not sure how that happens. Um, the nearest I can come to, to trying to account, the nearest I can come is to say that we do know that when you put someone in an MRI machine, a, a, a 3T or a 7T MRI, the static field in that can cause uh, vestibular balance type sensations. Uh, it'll cause nystagmus, it'll cause your eyes to move, in fact, in many people. Um, again, what happens is this, again, it, it's, it's an effect on the vestibular system, which has its hair cells in, 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 in there, and there are net ionic currents going into the this is what a vestibular system looks like. It's got a ring of fluid here, and it's got a paddle in the middle, and in the paddle, into the paddle are hairs of cells that are growing around here, called hair <laughs> cells. And uh, when you move the head, the paddle moves because the fluid doesn't move as fast. Uh, and uh, when the paddle moves, it deflects the hairs, and uh, they signal movements occurred. Okay? And <coughs> these hair cells uh, have, have maintained us a, a very, a very um, sensitive because they've got a net ionic current that's going into them, okay? Now, that magnetic, that ionic current interacts with the magnetic field um, and that causes, I don't know what this is talking about, actually. <laughs> it causes Lorentz forces on the endolymph fluid pushes on the ampulla, which is the paddle in the middle, and it'll deflect the hair cells a bit. Um, sorry, you 
can, you probably understand this, or somebody here should understand it. Um, but that's how the magnetic field interacts with the sense of balance in your ears. It interacts with this ionic current and causes a force on the hair cells. And the very clever people who proved that this was the case can prove it because they put people into the MRI scanner with their head in different positions. When your head is in different positions, your balance organs are in different positions and they signal different movements of the head. And different movements of the head cause your eyes to saccade in different directions. And if you're really clever, you can put all this information together and figure out exactly what's happening. So, take the key from me. Magnetism interferes with the brain. Uh, last way of interfering with the brain, <coughs> which is quite interesting, is pulsed ultrasound stimulation. Pulsed ultrasound stimulation at the right frequencies um, can, of course, heat up the brain, and people use it to heat up the brain and actually cause lesions in the brain. Ultrasound, you can focus, of course, to a small point, and there are machines on the market now that allow you to produce lesions in particular parts of the brain using pulsed ultrasound. And they have an array of uh, ultrasound uh, microphones, uh, not, sorry, loudspeakers, effectively, uh, around the head, and it can be focused on any 3D position within the brain, heat it up, and cause a lesion there. And the machines are on the market. Uh, and these machines, in fact, the, the surgeons who use them will tell you that these machines uh, will also stimulate the brain. They'll also cause the patient sometimes to feel sensations if they stimulate the right bits of the brain uh, before they cause a lesion to occur. Uh, there have been experiments uh, on rats, again, using pulsed ultrasound, uh, uh, and they can show that pulsed ultrasound to, say, the motor area of the rat brain can produce twitches of, uh, of the opposite side of the body. Um, so the, the pulsed ultrasound somehow activates the neural tissue. Um, it's not entirely clear what happens whether it's the, uh, the movement of the membrane of the neurons causing ion channels to open is one possibility that then causes uh, activation of the neurons. Another possibility is that the ultrasound can interact at the synapse, at the synapses between neurons. Uh, we have uh, synaptic vesicles which contain transmitter lined up uh, in uh, the, the presynaptic terminal here and they're lined up next to the membrane, and some people have suggested that the ultrasound can cause fusion of the vesicles with the membrane, causing release of transmitter and you know, activation that way. Um, so it's not entirely clear how the ultrasound works, and, um, it, but it does seem to do something. So, um, and it's been described as doing something in humans as well, which is even more interesting. It, if it's all true, because it can be focused, it does provide a way of, of hitting somewhere deep in the brain um, without stimulating anything else. So it's really interesting. What worries me is that nobody knows quite what it's doing to the neurons, and whether it's damaging them in any way. We've been doing some experiments with this um, in uh, just simple nerve preparations, crab nerves, nerves from the legs of crabs that you can get from the market. Uh, and you can stimulate those. And if you use ultrasound to try to stimulate those, you can do. Um, and from what the engineer people in my university tell me, <coughs> they say, from the properties of the sound and the um, noise that it makes when it stimulates the, neuro the, the, the axon, it sound it, they think it's creating cavitation in the membrane, causing the membrane uh, the bilipid membrane to change shape and therefore acting on ion channels in the membrane and causing uh, uh, ions to flow across the membrane and stimulate. But we don't really know how, whether that's going to happen in the brain or not. But it's a really interesting thing to look at. Uh, okay, so that's low intensity, so it doesn't burn anything. Focused ultrasound seems to be interesting. Um, whether it's safe, we don't know. 
OK, so this is all fantastic. So what's the problem? Is there a problem? Well, there is a problem, actually. It's because um, many of the methods, TMS uh, is a good example. Um, things don't always work like they write in the books. By which I mean there's very often um, a very large inter-individual variation in what you get from one person's brain to what you get from another person's brain. Uh, and that is a bit irritating. You can do lots of clever experiments in the lab despite that. But when you want to do something that might be therapeutically useful, uh, then you want something that works on everybody in the same way. So having a technique that is a bit variable is a bit irritating. Um, so just to uh, give you an example of what I mean by variability. Um, here's a technique that people use a lot. We call this the paired pulse technique. And you do it on the motor cortex. And basically, you give two pulses to the motor cortex. And the first pulse suppresses the response to the second pulse. So there's an inhibitory effect of the first pulse on the second pulse. And we know that that's something to do with the neurotransmitter GABA in the brain. And it's a very clever way of looking at the GABAergic system of the brain. Great. And what you see is some very good inhibition. That's what the response should look like. And then it goes very much smaller when, when you get two pulses rather than one. And you can plot a nice time course of the amount of inhibition over certain intervals between the two stimuli. And that's great. And that's so great, you can use it as a student demo in, in a practical or anything, because it almost always works. But it doesn't always work. And in different people, uh, you get different effects. And in about 10% of people, you will see no inhibition at all. So when I do class demonstrations of this, uh, every now and again, I'll get some idiot who has no, <laughs> no inhibition when I want to demonstrate it. And I know that happens, and so I say, don't worry, uh, let's try it on someone else. And we just, you know, we just mosey along. And it, and it, work, it always works the second time. Um, and nobody remembers. But it doesn't always work. And it's really irritating. Why doesn't it work? Is it, does it mean that their inhibitory neurotransmitters are all wrong in the brain? No, it doesn't mean that. They're perfectly normal. It means that my technique isn't good enough to measure it in the, that particular person. That's, now that's worrying, that's upsetting it, to know that. that. You've got something and it works in somebody. Why is it working in the other person? Uh, okay. Uh, and there are other techniques. There's techniques where you give repetitive stimulation to the brain and then look what happens after the period of repetitive stimulation. So very often people give, this is called theta burst stimulation. It's about 600 pulses applied over two minutes or so. Very rapid stimulation of the brain. And if you do that, you often get after effects that persist on the brain in terms of increasing or decreasing its excitability. And people plot graphs and say, oh, well, this paradigm makes the brain more excitable, and this paradigm makes the brain less excitable, and that's all hunky-dory and good. But if you take something like this paradigm and you actually look what happens in a very large number of people, again, you find these are individual people's responses to that you know, inhibitory paradigm, you find that it looks a bit like this. Uh, now, obviously, there's obviously a bit, a bit of variability from one person to another, but when you do all 52 people, um, then you see that the, you know, the variability is absolutely terrible. Uh, it's, it, it's upsettingly terrible, because, um, you know, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> it does, it, what happens is that uh, individuals respond usually in a particular way, but the different people respond differently. So why is this? Well, this is what we've got to do better. We have to understand what's happening. Now, when you think about it, what's happening is difficult. Stimulation is exciting many different types of neurons, excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. And the neurons are going to project to different targets, and they're going to have different functions. So when you stimulate the brain with TMS, it's hardly surprising that you get a mess. Because what you see is just the net effect of stimulating a mixed population of neurons. 
So here we are, we can stimulate the brain, yes, but we're stimulating a terrible mix of stuff. So when you look to see what happens, you get a mix of effects. And the mix is different in different people. Simple. What do you have to do? Well, what we need are different ways of targeting the stimulus pulses to stimulate different sets of neurons, to try and stimulate more selectively different sets of neurons. How do you do that? Well, uh, we're not sure, but you can. We know that neurons are differentially sensitive to the amplitude and duration of pulses. They have different strength, duration, time constants. So we'd like a stimulator that we can not only change the amplitude of the pulse, but one we can change the width of the stimulating pulse so that we can target particular neurons. We also know neurons are directionally selective. Uh, a linear axon stimulated, you know, by currents going parallel to it. Okay? Neurons are lined up in particular directions in the brain. And in fact, if you use directional stimulation of the brain, you can selectively activate different sets of neurons. So I think what we have to do these days, just to finish, really, is to make a combination of these effects and look how changing the pulse strength, duration, and, uh, and uh, direction can help us target different neurons in the brain. And uh, one of the things I'd like engineers to do is to really work on the first one, which is uh, shaping pulses so that they activate particular sets of neurons, neurons that have particular properties, perhaps. Uh, and by doing that, we might get more reproducible effects in individual people. So that's my message for today. Um, improve things, and <laughs> we'll, do, we'll just do all the experiments again, and it'll work much better. So thanks. <laughs>